Praise the Lord, Cornerstone North. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. I am eager to teach this lesson today. Really had this placed on my mind today. God's grace has reminded me of the text and uh, given me guidance for this particular Bible study tonight. I hope you can grab your pens today, get some paper, or have your Bibles and circle these verses. We will go through quite a bit today because I really want this to be embedded into our hearts. Um, do not forget our daily devotions. Please turn in your discipleship assignments. And I'm praying and believing that this Sunday will be our final drive-in service as we prepare to come back to our church. But more information will be revealed as we get closer to that. And then keep the Claibornes in prayer. Just confirm that they will be with us for a great revival coming up this month as well, going into June. All right, let's pray. Let's ask God to speak through me. Um, God is always on time, and I know that he has given me great direction for our church. And I know he knows everything that's going on within our congregation. And so I believe that God is, is about to fix uh, a lot of things with this lesson if you'll take heed to it. So let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Father, we love you. We appreciate your word. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sharing your truth with me. I'm asking you to please open my mind, God, to understand your scriptures. Touch my heart to love the truth. Speak through me to every saint. Help me minister Jesus, grace, and truth to every heart. God, I'm asking you to confirm your word in every home today. We'll give you all the glory because you can do this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. All right. Let us begin this Bible study today with a short introduction to where this is coming from. Um, I want to make sure that everyone understands this. I was not born a Christian. I was not born a Christian. And I also was not reborn a Christian. And I want to clarify that statement. The Bible says that we are a new creation when we are born again. But becoming a Christian is not something that happens when you go down in Jesus' name. Being a Christian means you're Christ-like, um, and that takes a few things. It takes um, time. This is why the word Christian is not found in Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 8, Acts 10. It's not found to Acts 11. It takes time. It takes information, the Apostles' Doctrine, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, uh, Torah, etc. And then it takes circumstances. It takes situations arising in your life that will prove if the information uh, that you have ingested is actually forming you to be Christ-like. So nobody's born a Christian. Nobody is reborn a Christian. All of us have to work towards it. And uh, so today I want to help you with one of the most important lessons that can help you get there. So with that being said, Christianity has one uh, major struggle. Yeah, obviously, it's it can masquerade itself in different ways, but for the most part, there seems to be a pattern through it, and it's found in your heart and in your mind. And so um, two words, two words forever changed my life, and that is when I became a new creation and I begin to work uh, on trying to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ situations and, and things would happen in my life and I had two options I can behave like what the Bible says or I can behave against it and uh, and so but there's there was situations in my walk with God where the Holy Ghost had to speak to me and and these are the two words the Holy Ghost spoke to me that forever changed my life and I hope in this We'll do the same for you, and uh, I'll give you the biblical evidence to show you how valuable it is. And that is, these are the two words, and this is our subject tonight. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Those are the two words that forever changed my life. Humble yourself. So let's define humble. Humble or humility is having or showing a modest or a low estimate of one's own importance. Okay, its antonym, its opposite is pride. Pride is a, a really high self-esteem, a person that is showy, or having 
an overestimation of one's self-importance. So that's the opposite of humble. Now, some of the natural questions you need to ask yourself as a Christian is, uh, out of the two of these, what do we inherit? Uh, which of these two are we supposed to continue to develop? Uh, which one is best for us? And uh, let's begin this lesson by me saying this, because we're all in the same struggle. And that is, my name is Jesse Gamboa, and I struggle and fight and wrestle with pride. I struggle, fight, and wrestle with pride. And what's the solution? Well, Hebrews 4 and 12 teaches us that the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's going to help us discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so the Word of God can help us discern um, if we're facing a, a, a pride issue in our life. Uh, the Word of God can give us the, the medicine for it. The Word of God can teach us to discern if it's been masquerading itself as something else. Um, the Word of God is quick and powerful, and it is the only thing that penetrates the dividing asunder to help us understand what we're really struggling with. So we're going to dive into the Word of God because as a, as a new creature trying to become this Christian, um, as a new person in this faith, I remember having to come to terms with these realities, accepting them to be real, and then beginning to work on them. And I want to help you as a saint of God um, Push yourself to aim for that which is humility, to humble yourself. So let's dive into the word of the Lord. The first time that the word humble is used is found in the book of Exodus, ironically. Um, in Exodus chapter number 10, verse number 3, uh, that is first used to a specific individual. And, I, and I'm going to expound on this here for a moment. The Bible says in Exodus 10 and 3, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh. And said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. So this is the first time the word humble is used in your King James Bible. And it's being used by God, speaking to Pharaoh, a specific um, self-professed demigod. Okay, and so, so I find it fascinating how this scenario. So one of the things as a student of the scripture is in order to, to continue to develop towards Christianity, you're going to have to use the word of God and, and use the biblical examples to analyze, am I struggling like Pharaoh is? Am I struggling like somebody else is? If so, what was the remedy um, and what are the consequences if I don't correct this before it's too late? Um, and so let me expound on Exodus 10 and 3. I, I want you to notice how pride is connected to idolatry. Pride, pride, your, uh, our pride, your pride, my pride, it, it makes you an idolater. You worship yourself. You, you have an overestimation of your, uh, whether it's your appearance, whether it's your uh, logic, whether it's your knowledge, whether it's your finances, whether it's your opinion. Um, it's an overestimation. It's idolatry. And here Pharaoh is a prideful man. And God tells him, how long are you going to refuse to humble yourself? This is actually in Exodus 10. This is already by plague number 8, I believe. And so I want you to notice how pride is connected to idolatry. And pride, it mutates and it masquerades itself as something else. Um, but when something you're fighting or struggling with is being masqueraded, you have to use the Word of God because it's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So you have to use the Word of God to try to get penetrate in there and properly diagnose you um, what is actually going on in your heart. I want you to see another thing. Pride views itself equal to or above God. Pride uh, will hear from God and take it as, well, I appreciate your opinion, God. I appreciate what you're saying, God. Um, but my opinion is equal to or even greater than yours. This is why I refuse to let the people of Israel go. I want you to notice how pride refuses to obey. Pride doesn't care if you're telling it the truth. Pride doesn't care 
if you've shown miracle signs and wonders, pride refuses to let go of and do what God has asked of an individual. I want you to notice how pride is selfish. Uh, God is telling Pharaoh, these are my people, and I want them to serve and worship me. But Pharaoh's pride tells him, these are my people, and I own them. And so pride makes people believe that they have ownership of things and that everything is for their service. Well, this is a reality that I realized. Um, I, I bought 10 acres of property. I own them outright. When I die, who owns them? Somebody else. I really don't have ownership of anything. It, it, everything I have in life is borrowed. It's just something. It's a piece of paper that says you own it, but you don't own it. Because heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word will not pass away. So pride gives you a false sense of ownership and a false sense of selfishness. And then I want you to notice that God is using this term humble uh, to try to help Pharaoh avoid the disaster of losing his son, uh, his firstborn. Pharaoh's life is a demonstration that humility could have helped Pharaoh avoid the pain that his life produced. So pride causes pain, destruction, issues, problems. It affects you. It affects your country, your nation, your family, your friends. Humility was the antidote to pride. And Pharaoh serves as a uh, great example for you and I that we are to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves. All right. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 8, verse number 2. Uh, this is written to the next generation, and, I want, and, and I'll expound on this here in a second, but this is the next generation. This is the group of people that came out of Egypt, the children of them um, that had not yet perished. So the people perished. This is the next generation. This is the second reading of the law uh, to the people of Israel that have survived basically the slaughter of the wilderness. And God speaks to them in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 2, and this is what he says. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. Look at this. To humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So this is the next generation of Israelites that are hearing the Torah from Moses. And they're being told why God allowed their parents to go through the wilderness for 40 years. And it had to do with a pride issue. It had to do with the same exact pride that Pharaoh had, ironically. So, so, so you could almost, I guess you would almost say this, that because they sat under Pharaoh for so long and leadership tends to affect its followers, that not only was the leader of Egypt prideful, and not only were the Egyptians prideful, but even the slave Hebrews were prideful. And so pride will go all the way down from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top. And here we see that God, for 40 years, tried to get Israel to humble themselves, to prove themselves to obey. So, like I said at, at the introduction of this, God will use time information and circumstances to get us to change from being prideful to being humble. Life is going to prove if we are full of pride or if we are overcoming it and pursuing humility. On the journey, I want you to think about this, on the journey to the promised land, it was a, it was a journey to the promised land, but they had to develop humility in the wilderness. So humility was the pathway to the promised land, not pride. Okay, this is why it's so important. So, And this is a congregation that God is speaking to. Before he was talking to Pharaoh, now he's talking to a congregation, an entire inheritance of Israel that is hearing, guys, God wants you to obey. I want you to notice uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, verse number 14, another example of the power of humility. Bible says this, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and will heal their land. I want you to notice that the scripture is revealing what humble people do. Humble people pray, 
Humble people seek, humble people turn, which means that the opposite would be prideful people. Prideful people don't pray, prideful people don't seek, and prideful people don't turn from wickedness. Humility prays to God, seeks after God, and will turn from anything that God reveals is inaccurate biblically. So I want you to notice this. The, the next thing is I want you to notice that humility, humble people get heard, humble people get forgiven, and humble people get healed. So I want you, I, I want you to notice how being a pursuing humility, humbling yourself, gets God's ear, God's attention. Humbling yourself gets you forgiven. And humbling yourself gets you healed by just being humble. So you can heal marriages, relationships, problems, issues by being humble. It, you can fix it. You can, get, you can get heard. You can be forgiven by just pursuing humility. Humble yourself is what God is saying. Look at Proverbs 16 and 19. The Bible says this. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So let me break it down in the, not the KJV version, but into the how you like them apples version. The how you like them apples version says this. No matter what, humility is better. Okay? In other words, God would rather you be a broke joker with a humble spirit than be a rich, prideful, arrogant punk. God's like, what's the point of being rich if, you, if, if you're poor in humility? And God's saying, you don't understand. It's better to be the broke guy that can barely pay his bills, but he's humble than to be the rich guy eating his filet mignon of steaks, but having pride. So, for, so if you ever want to know how God feels about your success, your successes mean nothing to God if you're not humble. Humility is better no matter what you think you've succeeded in in life. Proverbs 29, 23 says this, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. So I want you to notice this. No matter how high your pride takes you, no matter how high you think you're going because you're a prideful person, no matter how high, what ladder you climb and what business you achieve and what thing you do in life, no matter what you do going this way, and your pride is what's, what's, it's your energy to get there, the Bible says it will bring you down to the lowest parts of the lake of fire. It, it may not be in this lifetime where your pride gets you brought down. But can I tell you, and I hope this didn't happen to Steve Jobs. I hope you, I hope, I, listen, I hope God fig figured it out. I don't know, whatever. But can you imagine amassing the wealth that Steve Jobs did and all the people he hurt and all the people he attacked and all the people he used and all the people he stole from and all the people. He climbed this social ladder and he didn't, I mean, his company didn't fail. Nothing went wrong. He, he, he died a billionaire. But when he gets judged according to the scriptures, his soul will be brought to the lowest parts of the lake of fire. He's going to get brought low. And so no matter how high you think you go because of pride, it will always bring you low. It will always bring you low. And it doesn't matter if it happens in this lifetime or the next lifetime. It's going to happen because God said it and God's word never fails. Another thing that I want you to point out here is how humility brings you honor and it upholds you. But when you're humble, God honors you. And God upholds you. In other words, God is holding you up. And, and, and can I tell you something about being hum humble that's amazing? When God's holding you up, who can tear you down? When God is the one lifting you up, who can tear you down? See, when it's God, see, if, if, if man is who's holding you up, then man can bring you down. But if it's God that's bringing you and upholding you up, brother, sister, I'm telling you, You'll be upheld and you'll be honored, not because of pride, because of humility. Isaiah 57 and 15 says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, talking about God, whose name is holy, 
I will dwell in the high and the holy place. Now I want you to notice, okay, I want you to notice the key here. God is saying, this is my dwelling place. I dwell in eternity. I inhabit eternity. My name is holy. And I want you to notice what humility, I want you to, I want you to notice what humility gives us. The Bible says, God said this, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is contrite and humble of spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble. God wants a revival of humility. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God wants a revival of humility. Revival. I'm telling folks. A revival of humility gets you to heaven. A revival of humility gets you holy. A revival of humility gets you to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. A revival of humility. We don't hear a lot about a revival of humility but God says I want to revive the spirit of the humble think about that we want revival in finances we want revival of miracles we want revival of this and we want revival of that we want a, a harvest of the souls and we want this and we want that and God is saying hey let me give you a secret about heaven y'all need a revival of humility think about that God wants to revive humble people somebody said amen Look at Mark, uh, I'm sorry, look at Matthew 18 and 4. And uh, I love this verse, this verse of scripture. The Bible says this, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility gets you into the kingdom. He, Jesus is saying, hey, you, you want to be in the kingdom? You got to be humble like this child. Do you want to be great in the kingdom? You got to humble. You got to be humble like this, like this child. Think about that. We live in a world that tries to get us prideful, make us prideful, teach us pride, inject us with pride, program us to be prideful. Even religion does the same thing. And God says, if you want to get into the kingdom, you're going to have to humble yourself. And if you're going to want to stay in the kingdom, you're going to have to humble yourself. And if you're going to want to do anything in the kingdom that's great, you're going to have to humble yourself. Think about that for a second. Jesus Christ said this. In, uh, go to Matthew 23. We're going to actually going to read quite a bit out of Matthew 23, so start prepping for that. Pride can mutate itself into religions. And can masquerade itself as righteousness. And we're going to learn how Jesus deals with this in Matthew 23. I want you to go there. I want you to highlight some of these verses that I'm going to read with you. Very important portion of scripture. Because the longer you live for God, uh, the, the, the more that you and the longer that you live for God, uh, I have seen pride. What I have, what I have seen pride do is uh, I've seen pride come into people's lives that are now living right. And it masquerades itself as righteousness. It masquerades itself as other things. And, and what happens is that these people are oblivious that the real problem is pride. And so I want to help you see. And, and, and this is kind of what I do. Um, what I do is, is it's, if I'm reading scripture and it starts hitting me because I'm doing some of this stuff. Or, I, you know, I've been thinking this way or acting this way or talking this way or, uh, you know, it... it I, I tend to look at it and say, well, that's God's talking to me right now. Yeah, and and if, if you read some of this stuff and you're like, well, that's not me. That's pride. Hallelujah. <laughs> so either way, uh, God's going to help us today. Matthew 23 and verse number one. Jesus, again, is speaking. The Bible says, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. This is what he said. Verse two. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, this is what Jesus is saying. Pride overestimates itself, and we see it by where it tries to position itself. Pride, pride makes you believe you deserve to be in Moses' seat. Pride makes you want to sit in Moses' seat. Pride makes you want to judge like you're the prophet Moses. Pride, it makes you comfortable being there. And can I tell you, this is something that God has always taught me because I wasn't born into this. Um, you're not Moses. <laughs> God has always reminded me, you're Jesse Gamboa. You are not Moses. And so don't sit on Moses' seat. 
thinking that you're this high and great and lofty and powerful man uh, because you're just as fragile as every other sinner in this entire planet. And pride gets you to believe that you deserve to be in a specific position, and pride gets you to believe that you deserve to say uh, or carry the honor of somebody else like Moses. That's what Jesus is revealing here. Look at verse number three. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. Why? For they say and do not. <laughs> now, how many times have you dealt with people uh, that expect more from others than they do themselves? They expect more from you than they do of themselves. And here in verse 3, Jesus is saying, prideful people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they expect more from others than they do themselves. They say, but they don't do. They judge at a different measure than they judge themselves. There is a, there is a pride issue. They, they feel like they deserve to tell others what to do, but they feel like they don't have to do any of what they advise others. Pride can masquerade itself. And you may think, well, how come this guy tells me to do something, but he doesn't do it? I, I, pride. Pride, 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 pride. Let's move on. Verse number four. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Pride burdens people, right? Pride wants to put things on people. Pride wants to burden people with things that they themselves would not do. That's what pride does. Pride, I'm telling you, pride is such this, this mutant virus, man, it's, it, it, it just, it gets inside of us and we, we, we may not even know what we're doing to ourselves or to others and, and, and we think it's righteousness, but it's, 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 it's pride. It's pride. That's what Jesus says. Look at verse number five. But all their works they do, look at this. God's, God's given us a revelation of why these people do this, this type of pride people do this. All these works they do to be seen of men. Oh, your boss walks into work, and as soon as he walks in, you start cleaning extra. You want to make sure that the boss sees you instead of giving your best at all times because God sees you. See, pride, the Bible says they do this to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their, their garment. In other words, for pride, it's all a show. Pride is all a show. For pride, it's just to be seen. For pride, is, it's, it's to make something of yourself. For pride, pride has the wrong motives. Look at this. Look at verse number six. They love. Pride loves. They love the uppermost rooms at the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. Pride loves the best. Pride loves the, pride, pride wants the best seats. Pride wants, pride wants the uppermost Pride wants, let me tell you something about pride, and, and God has constantly been good to me about rebuking me, is I, I remember I had this terrible attitude when I got on my uh, United Airlines flight, and, and, and I walked up to the stewardess, and, and I said, uh, ma'am, I, I checked my, 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 my pass, and it, it just didn't seem like I got my first class upgrade. And they're like, well, I'm sorry, it, it was given to somebody else. You, you didn't get it this time. And I felt offended. I felt angry. I felt flustered. I felt annoyed. I felt like, who, do you know who I am? I spent X amount of dollars on your airlines, and, I, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm this, and I'm that. And God said, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Who do you think you are, boy? You couldn't even afford to fly. You were taking greyhounds to Spokane. Who do you think you are, boy? You better sit down and shut up and have a good attitude. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, pride sneaks in there and gives you a sense of entitlement. I deserve this seat. I deserve this recognition. Look at this, verse number seven. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. In other words, pride loves to be recognized. Lo pride not only loves to be recognized, but pride loves titles. Man, people walk up. He's a doctor, he's a lawyer, he's a this. I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G on my name. I've gone to school and have all these degrees. And God says, hogwash. 
I anointed a bunch of fishermen to set this thing in order. What's wrong with you? God wants us to know today that pride desires recognition. Pride desires titles. Pastor, why are you talking to us about this stuff? Because as our church is growing, brothers and sisters, and, 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 you, and you feel like, how come Pastor didn't recognize me? And how come I'm not being recognized? Ooh, that's a, uh, there's some pride stirring. And how come Pastor gave him a title and he didn't give me a title? Uh-oh, pride is stirring. It's starting to, it's starting to you got to call me. I'm the youth pastor. No, you got to call me at this. And you got to call me at well, pride, 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 pride. That, that pride radar needs to rise up. It's like, a, it's, it's like a storm warning. Hey, pride. Look at verse number eight. God is good to us, though. Look what, look what God throws in here to try to help us today. The Bible says this, but be not ye called rabbis. For one is your master, even Christ, and all are brethren. God says humility is on an equal playing field. God said nobody here is master but the Christ. You guys are all brothers and sisters. Pride helps you realize I'm just like him, and he's just like me. I'm flesh, he's flesh. I have weaknesses, he has weaknesses, I have strength, he has strength. I don't, I, I don't matter any more than he does. He doesn't matter any more than I does. We're all brethren. Well, I just, think, I just think that I'm a little more important than that person that is not as wealthy in me in the church. Oh, pride. Pride. God's always reminded me, Jesse, the people are not, fair, the people are not there for you. That's pride speaking. You're there to serve the people. Look at this. I'll show it to you. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither, neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Humility doesn't need titles. Humility doesn't need recognition. Humility doesn't think it's above anybody. Humility thinks that the person that takes out the trash is just as vital as the man that preaches the message. Humility views everybody as brothers and sisters, and we all need the same Savior, the same cross, the same blood, the same mercy. But pride makes you think you're just you're cut from a different, different cloth. You're a little bit better than everybody else. That's what pride does. Look at verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. My God in heaven, Jesus is preaching revolutionary. Jesus could have said, but he that is greatest among you is the most talented. He that is greatest among you is the smartest. He that is greatest among you has the most money. He that is, he that, he that is greatest among, uh, among you can boss everybody around. No, 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 brothers. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. How can I help you? I'm here to serve. I, 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 I'm not that important. Let, let me help you. That's what the scripture says. Look at verse number 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, thrown down. And he that shall humble himself, God says, ooh, here we go. Let me raise you up. I'm going to exalt you because you are humbling yourself. See, in Christianity, our aim is down. Humble myself. I'm going to lower my, lower my entitlement, lower what I think, lower what I think of myself, lower, lower. I'm going to shoot down, and God will raise us up. The target for, for every person that wants to be Christ-like, like Jesus Christ, is humility. Pastor, can you prove that? Yes, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Whoever shall exalt himself gets abased, but whoever humbles himself gets exalted. Jesus came down, and then he got taken back up. Because humility goes down, but God raises it up. Satan, on the other hand, exalted himself. And God said, oh, you're going down, and you ain't never coming back up. This scripture is fulfilled in Jesus Christ's ministry and his life and in his death, burial, resurrection. Look at this. Look at verse number 13. 
Because then Jesus gets really, really, really real. Okay. Somebody say Jesus is so real. And uh, he is. You're about to see how real he is. A lot of people have, have misrepresented Jesus as being somebody that would never, ever uh, say anything that could sound controversial or offensive or thought-provoking or countercultural. Here Jesus begins his woes. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, and you, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Let me make it simple. Jesus is saying pride makes you lost. Pride makes you lost. Pride is going to keep you out of the kingdom of God. Pride is going to keep others out of the kingdom of God because of you. And pride is going to make you block others from getting into the kingdom of God because you're prideful. They're getting in and you're not. So, ah, uh, have you ever wondered why your family don't want you to go to church? Have you ever wondered why people don't want you to really transform your life? You ever wonder why people try to stop you from living for God? I'll tell you why. Pride. They don't want you to, they don't want you to get what they're not willing to humble themselves and get themselves. They're not wanting you to get a hold. I'm telling you, pride standing in the way of sinners. Look at this. Look at verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. What does pride do? Pride produces hypocrites. Produces hypocrites. Pride devours houses. Think about that. Pride devours houses. Pride produces hypocrites. Pride will pray. Think about that. Prideful people pray. And they even pray long. It says you practice. You, 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 and for a pretense you make long prayer. You have a prayer life for the wrong reasons. Think about that. I, can I tell you, some folks only pray because they want to be anointed to preach. Some people only pray because they want a miracle. Some people only pray. There are people that only pray for the wrong reasons. Why? Pride. Pride. Pride, pride, pride. And pride gives us a greater damnation. Jesus said, your pride is going to give you a greater damnation. Can I tell you, better to be humble and be lost, which I don't think that's possible, but better to be humble and be lost than be prideful and think you're saved. Here the Pharisees and Sadducees believe that they're saved. They believe that they're God's elect. They believe that they're the separate ones. They believe that they're righteous. They believe they're the last remnant. They believe they know everything. And God says, your pride has given you a greater damnation. Think about that. Verse 15, look at this. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you have made him a twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Let me, let me break that down. Pride reproduces itself twice as bad and as lost as themselves. God help us. Pride reproduces pride. Pride reproduces a double trouble. Pride reproduces a doubly lost and blind person. Pride reproduces a double hypocrite. Pride. Pride is a mess. Look at verse 16. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whatsoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. I want you to notice how God says, Pride makes you blind. He said, Woe unto you, blind guides. Pride blinds you. You don't know what. You, see, the Pharisees thought they were leading, they thought they were guiding, they thought they could see. They thought their eyesight worked. They thought their discernment worked. And here the Bible says that Jesus, the truth, the word of God, 
was alive and powerful and standing right before. Hebrews 4.12 is right, is happening. Jesus is, Jesus is Hebrews 4.12. And, and Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you don't realize you're blind. You're blind, you're blind, you're blind. You don't see. And what you think you see is a lie because you're blind. Look at verse 17. And listen, I didn't say this. Jesus said this. He said, you fools. You fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore sweareth shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Pride makes you illogical. The Pharisees are, their theology's off. Their logic is off. Their revelation is off. They are illogical. And the reason they're illogical is because of pride. Pride. They don't even know what is more valuable than what. They don't even know what's more important than what. Pride makes you. How many times have you talked to somebody and they're, they're, they're man, you guys are having a good argument and, and, and everything they're saying is illogical. There's like no logic behind it. And, but they won't stop talking. They won't stop fighting. They won't back down. And it's like pride. Like, why not just say, you know what? I actually don't know. <laughs> you know? Let's have, a, let's have a revival of I don't know. You know, people ask me, all, I've had saints ask me for, uh, Pastor, can you explain this? I don't know. I'm actually going to have to research that because I, I don't know. I'm not going to try to make it up, throw it together, fly by the, the seat of my pants. No, I, that's pride. Humility says, I don't know. I need to pray. I don't know. I need to fast. I don't know. I need to study. I don't know. I need to seek counsel. I don't know. So I'm, I'm going to do what humility does. Get help. Look at this. Verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe on mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Pride omits the weightier stuff. Pride doesn't want to talk about real issues. Pride doesn't want to talk about real struggles. Pride doesn't want to talk about the real stuff we're supposed to be doing. Pride doesn't want to focus on the heavier stuff that God has placed in his word. Pride wants to, I want you to notice what pride focuses on. Pride focuses on money. <laughs> pride, is, pride is saying, hey, come on, bring your tithes. Hey, come on, pay your tithe and everything. And, and God says, you ought to do that. You, you, ought to, you, you ought to do that, but there's some more important things we got to talk about. Like, we got to talk about how we're supposed to judge things right. Uh, we got to talk about, about, we got to talk about mercy. Like having mercy on others and, and giving mercy and receiving mercy and being merciful, manifesting mercy because God gave us mercy. God, God is saying there's some bigger fish we got to talk about, but, but pride omits them. And how about faith? We've got to talk about faith. The Bible says judgment, mercy, and faith. We, we have to bring up the weightier matters of God's word. But see, pride says, ah, let's, those things take a backseat. Let's focus on the stuff that are here and now, the flesh stuff, money. Hallelujah. Somebody said amen. Look at verse 24. Ye blind guides which straight at, uh, straight strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. In other words, you're willing to hit a gnat, but you'll swallow a camel of sin. He says, this is why. Your pride. Your pride. Look at verse number 25. Woe unto uh, you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup or of the platter, but within you're full of extortion and excess. Pride cleans up. It cleans up the outside, but pride never cleans up the inside. Pride is so clean on the outside that it stops working on the inside. Pride lets you think that because you fooled everybody that it's okay to be full of extortion and excess. Okay? 
And religion tends to do this to people. Religion wants you to just focus on the outside, but let you live with what's wrong with you on the inside. And God said, no, 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 no. That's a prideful thing because it's the outside that people can see, not the inside. But it's the inside that God starts at, not the outside. Look at this. Look at verse 26. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first. Everybody say first. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter. Then that, that what's outside the platter may be clean also. Pride has everything reversed. Pride thinks we, we work on the way out and then, we'll, and then we'll work on the way in. No, brothers. God says humility starts right here. God created me a clean heart and maybe a clean heart will have me start dressing like I have a clean heart. God, give me a clean mind and maybe I'll start talking like I have a clean mind. God, so, so, so pride starts on the outside in. Humility starts on the inside out. Should have noticed that. Two different, it's reversed. Look at verse 27. Woo unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye like, uh, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, really clean graves, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside, but are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Pride deceives and has bones and uncleanness. It's trying to hide. And let me add this in there. The only reason that pride has things in its closet is because pride doesn't let you repent. <laughs> what I love about living for God is, is if you'll humble yourself and repent, there's nothing you need to hide in your closet. If you put it under the blood, if boy, you've already repented. You've asked for forgiveness. I told you I'm faithful and just to forgive in 1 John 2, 1. I, God says, it's done. It's been remitted. It's been forgotten. It's been cast out. It's been buried. But see, pride doesn't let you repent. So you have to hide the dead bones you're hiding. Pride has all kinds of uncleannesses that nobody knows about. Hallelujah. Look at verse 28. Even so ye are also, you outwardly, you outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. In other words, you do whatever you want. Pride outwardly looks righteous to the unobservant eye, but God sees hypocrisy and iniquity. Pride is filled with I will do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want, and is filled with hypocrisy. That's what pride produces. It produces a, a trash can of a life on the inside. Okay. Look at verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, pay attention, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them of the blood of the prophets. Think about that. Think about what they said. Jesus said, pride thinks that it would do better than somebody else in the same situation. God help me preach. God help me preach. Pride, pride looks at other people's issues and says, if I had the same issues they had, I'd be doing better than they are. Oh, help me, Lord. You bump into somebody and you have no idea what they've gone through. You have no idea the suffering. You have no idea the pain. You have no idea the backstory. You have no idea what's really going on. You have not been in the same situation. You've not been in the same circumstance. You have no clue how it feels. You have no idea anything, but yet you hear the situation and you think you can do better than somebody else. You know why? Pride. Because pride is an overestimate of yourself. Instead of saying, you know something... If I was in the same situation, I, I, I may have done the same thing. If I, you know, that, that poor guy that, that, that couldn't feed his family and he ran to the store and he grabbed a loaf of bread and he tried to get home to feed his children, you know something? I've never been more, I've never been broke like that, but if I was, maybe I'll, I'll do the same thing because I'm seeing my children starve to death and my wife crying, and so maybe I do, no, 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 that's humility. Humility is saying maybe I do it too because I'm not that strong. Pride says, I would never do what other people have done. I can do better than others. That's what pride says. Humility says, you know what? Given the same situation, 
given the same upbringing, given the same issues, given the same problems, maybe I would have done the same thing. I don't know. But see, it takes humility to think that way. Pride says, no, 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 no. I'm better. I'm better. Look at verse 31. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Look at this. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. You are serpents. You're a generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues, and you'll persecute them from city to city. Look at this. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed from the earth, the blood of the righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bacchus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you that all these things shall come upon this generation. Jesus is looking at pride square in the eye, and he is saying, you are violent, you are bloody, you love to hurt people. You love to see people suffer. In fact, you think you're better than others, but you would actually do worse than others. And Jesus said, you're a witness of what you're saying because here I am, the word of God, flesh, flesh and bone in front of you, and you're getting ready to crucify me, and you're going to crucify my men and my men and women of God, and you're going to persecute my wise men, and you're going to cast people out of the synagogues. And Jesus says, you don't even realize how lost you are. And he says in verse 33, how can you escape the damnation of hell with that much pride? How can you escape hell with that level of pride? That you think you're righteous, but all you have on your hands is the blood of the righteous. Jesus says, you guys don't get it. You guys don't see it. You guys can't discern it. Think about, and, and listen, folks, I'm, I'm telling you, and I, pride is violent. This is why when somebody bumps you, you get angry, and you want to you bow up on them. You want to square up on them, because pride is violent. Pride wants to take you down. Pride wants to fight back. Pride wants to. Humility. Jesus turns the other cheek. Jesus is attacked, and he's scourged, and he can just, he can, he can blink and wipe everything out, but he just takes it. Pride refuses to repent. Here, I want you to notice this. The word of God became flesh and preached to this generation of people, and they refused to repent. You and I have this, brothers and sisters. They had all of this in the genetics of a human man named Jesus Christ. The word of God in flesh. And he told them they're blind, filled with pride, filled with dead man's bones, filled with this, filled with that. Jesus, the word of God, confronted pride face to face, and they refused to respond and to repent. That's, that, that's how powerful pride is, is that God himself face to face can call you on your pride, and you won't even see it. Now, what does God say? I'm almost done. James 4 and 6 says this, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. Grace is given to the humble, not the prideful. Pastor, I, I'm struggling. I did this and that. It's all right. God has you. God has some grace for you. God gives grace to humble people, not prideful people. He resists the pride. He's like, I don't want to deal with this. Look at James 4 and 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So what is the solution? Humble yourself. That's what God told me. That's what God keeps telling me. Humble yourself. Why? Because if you humble yourself in my sight, Jesse, I'm going to lift you up above everything. People can throw you in dens. I'll lift you up. Humble yourself. Don't make me humble you. Humble yourself 
Get your mind low. Get your heart right. Get your spirit in alignment. Get Humble yourself and I will lift you up. And I will not stop lifting you up until I get you to heaven. If you'll humble yourself, you'll get to heaven. Look at 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Brother Miguel, I'm submitted to you. I'm subject to you. Why? Because I want to be humble. I'm submitted to my usher. I'm submitted to the saints. I'm submitted, I'm submitted to everybody. Why? Because I want to, God, help me be humble. God, I don't want to be a king. I don't want to have a complex. I don't want, to, I, I, I don't want pride to get in. I, I, I don't want to think I'm all in a bag of chips. I, I, I don't want to think that this is my church. I, I, I don't want to think that I deserve this. I, I, I don't want to think that this is mine. I, 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 I'm not Pharaoh. They're not my slaves. I'm a servant. They're the saints. I, I want to be humble. And he says this. If you do that and be clothed, clothed with humility, put it on every morning, put it on, wake up and get your, your humble shirt on, wake up and get your, your, your humble pants on, wake up and put your humble shoes on, wake up and put your humble mind on, wake up and put your humble mouth on, wake up and put humble your, us on yourself. He says, clothe yourself with humility. Why, pastor? Why do I got to humble myself? Brother, I'm trying to help you. Because God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. God wants to give you grace. But you can't get grace when you're prideful. It takes humility. Who do I think I am? I don't deserve this. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve anything. Clothe yourself with humility. Look at verse 6. 1 Peter 5, 6, last verse. Once again, Peter says it as well. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he, he may exalt you in due time. He may exalt you. If we humble ourselves, he lifts us up. In other words, lift off. Lift off is delayed by pride. Well, I, Pastor, I don't know how long I can be humble. Hey, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and let God deal with the timing. Because God said he will exalt you in due time. God knows when to exalt you. God knows how to exalt you. God knows why to exalt you. God knows all of those things. But God just wants you and God wants me and God wants Cornerstone North, our church, to humble ourselves. Be a humble church, Cornerstone North. Be humble, brothers and sisters. Be humble wives. Be humble sisters. Be humble siblings. Be humble husbands. Be humble children. Pursue humility. Get yourself humble. Why? God will exalt us in due time. It's coming. May not be today. May not be tomorrow. May not be next week. May not be next year. May not be next month. But I want it. But I can't. I can't. Due time doesn't begin until you get yourself Every time you, you step out of humility, the clock resets. Every time you get prideful, God says, ah, oh, here we go again. You, you almost lasted 24 hours. Any time, ah, oh, you almost lasted a week. You, you almost lasted a month. You almost lasted a year. God says, ah, oh, I almost. Humility is the key to lift off, and pride will delay it. I close with this. From Satan being cast out and cast down because of pride to Genesis chapter number three, when perfect humans, perfect humans. Can I just say this? And I'm picking this up in the Holy Ghost, so you can think I'm weird for this. There are people watching. I, listen, I don't know who's watching this, okay? All right? The camera does not tell me. I don't know how I have any information. But I'm talking to you right now. Right now, the person that just thought to themselves, this is not for me. 
Let me tell you something. Genesis chapter number 3, two human beings had no guile, had no sin, had no devil, had no nothing, had no issues. One temptation got them prideful. They heard the words that said, you can be as God. You can be like God. And pride stepped in. And instead of being happy with what, what God gave them, being happy with what God did for them, being happy with what God blessed them with, pride. Why? For the love of the world is what? Everything that's in the world is the pride of life. And here we're seeing in Genesis 3, perfect humans struggled with pride, and you and I are not perfect people, so you better believe this message is for you and for me today. Pride is destructive. Pride will destroy. Pride will damn. Pride will corrupt. Pride is terrible. So, Pastor, what do we have to do? We need to recognize it. Be able to see it. Look at it in the mirror. Like that pimple you used to have in high school. You were able to go to the mirror and say, oh, I got a pimple. You got to be able to look to the word of God and say, I'm prideful. I got pride issues. What do I do now? Pastor, I've recognized that I have pride. I'm acting like Saul. I'm acting like Cain. I'm acting like so-and-so. I'm acting like this. I'm not, okay, you, you, you see it? Yes. Okay, it's time to pray. God, help me not be that way. God, help me not live out those consequences. God, help me not walk down that path. God, help me repent from this situation. God, God, please, please, please don't let go of me. Don't give up on me. Don't walk out on me. Don't cast me out. Don't, don't leave me with your sin. I'm telling you, God, please don't let pride. Don't let. The Bible says that God resists the proud. So when I start to pick up on a little bit of pride, I'm saying, God, please don't resist my prayers. God, please don't close your ears to me. God, please don't turn your back on me. God, please don't let me go down this path. Why? Because I know where it goes. Destruction, despair, problems. What do I do next, Pastor? What do I do next? You ready? You ready? You recognize it. You pray against it. And then you humble yourself. Well, Pastor, that's, a, that's hard. You're telling me that I gotta, I actually gotta practice humility? You're telling me that I gotta practice it? One of the greatest things that God ever whispered into these human ears right here was humble yourself. 14 years later, I'm so glad I hope I heard those words. 14 years later, I'm so glad he reminds me of those words. Hallelujah. I start a church. God begins to do a wonderful work. Pride starts to come in, and God says, humble yourself. All of a sudden, the church starts doing good. Doors start opening. Recognition starts coming, and God says, humble yourself. Yourself. Invitations start coming. Recognition. Humble yourself. The urge to be served by others comes. Humble yourself. Fourteen years later, God is constantly reminding me of those two words. Humble yourselves. Because at the end of the day, practicing humility did good for me. Will continue to good. Will continue to do good for me. No matter if I feel like it or not. And this is my last, this is my last thought I want to share, and I'm done. God humbled himself and became a man to save mankind. And why is it that man cannot seem to just stay humble and be a man instead of trying to be God? I don't want to die. I don't want to do this. I don't want this. This is what I want. This is what I think. This is what. And God says, hey, you're still a man. The fact that God has to tell us to humble ourselves, it's because we have made ourselves go up. We're prideful. God's bringing us back down. This is why he made us from the dust of the earth. To remind us. Your glorified particles that I formed and I made and I gave you purpose and I gave you mission and I gave you breath and I gave you blessings and I gave you life. God is saying, get back down to earth where you belong. Quit trying to be me because you're not. Humble yourself. Church, I am challenging Cornerstone North. Let's aim for humility. Let's aim for humility.
and let's watch and see how our life gets better, our relationships get better, how we can hear from God, how we get grace, how we get mercy, how we get blessings, and, and how we start to treat each other correctly. But guess what? Guess where it all starts? Humble myself. Brother, let me tell you this. If you got an issue with somebody at Cornerstone North, any of my brothers and sisters, humble yourself. Be gracious. Be forgiving. Be merciful. Humble yourself. Well, Pastor, I don't want to humble myself. You don't understand how I feel right now. Humble yourself. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you want to humble yourself. You don't want God to get involved and start resisting you. You don't want God to start letting that thing mutate from being uh, uh, one simple, uh, one simple, uh, 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 a little stem of, of pride into this, this ginormous, huge tree trunk of pride. And then all of a sudden it starts bringing out branches of pride. And then all of a sudden it's gossip. And then it's fighting. And then it's this. And then it's a proud look. And then a proud heart. And then a proud tongue. And then a proud mind. And then a proud spirit. And, then, and all of a sudden it has branches all because you didn't, you didn't bring the axe. You didn't chop it off. Hey, I see pride on the rise. I see pride on the rise. Humble yourself. Well, they don't deserve my forgiveness. You don't deserve his forgiveness. They don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve his. When you're not willing to forgive and you're not willing to forget, God says, hypocrite. That's pride. Pride holds on. All bad stuff. Humility lets go. Jesus Christ was humility in flesh. He humbled himself. They put a cross on his back. Started beating his flesh. Told them, hey, are you the king of the Jews? They nailed him to the tree. And when he was up there, He's up there. Humility's hanging on a cross. The word of God is hanging on a cross. Humility's right there. They walk by and they say, hey, you saved others, humble man. Save yourself. No, brother, saving himself would have been an act of pride. Laying his life down would have been an act of humility. And so Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. Why? Because blind people are prideful people. Humble people can see. Humanity has no idea what it's up to, has no idea what it's doing, has no idea why it's doing it. it they're blind, so I'm going to forgive them. If you're not willing to forgive, then it's one of the sure symptoms of pride. Let's pray for a moment and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you that you have given us a divine appointment with you, O oh great physician. Lord, I'm asking you to please, please, please speak to every Cornerstone North Saint today and begin to help us reflect and use your word to find if there's any infections in my heart or in my mind of pride. And God, if it's there, I'm asking you to please forgive me. Please forgive me for watering it. Please forgive me for feeding it. Please forgive me, Jesus, for this pride. God, I'm asking you to help the word of God chop it at the root. God, I'm asking you to please, I want to I throw it out of my heart, my mind, and my spirit because I don't want you to resist me. God, I don't want you to resist me because of pride. I want to use humility to resist pride. Who do I think I am? What do I think I deserve? How do I think I got? No, no, sir. I want to be a humble man, Jesus. I want to get to heaven. I want to be somebody that you can trust. I want to be somebody that you can that you can write a letter about one day and show it to others that that humility can change humility can transform humility can deliver humility can do something great in people's lives that humility gets us to the Savior I'm asking you God help Cornerstone North be a humble church a forgiving church a merciful church a church that judges right a church of faith a church of grace, a church of mercy, a church of your presence, a church that does what you say, God, a church that doesn't believe itself to be God, but worships the one true God. Please, Jesus, bless my brothers and sisters, God, with a clear picture. Help them see if there's pride in there today and help them, God, chop it off and cut it out and throw it away, lest it destroy them, God, and corrupt them completely. Please, Jesus, do this for our church. 
We are a new church that is still finding our identity. Lord, we're a new church with many new creations in this church. And God, I'm asking you to please right now purge out pride. Get the pride out of marriages. Get the pride out of brothers. Get the pride out of sisters. Get the pride, God, out of elders. Get the pride out of me. Get the pride out of children. Help us today, Jesus, that Cornerstone North may reproduce and not be a prideful church, but be a church that is humble and that reproduces gracious people, godly people, loving people, merciful people, honorable people, God, unto you. We pray this by the authority of your precious name, Jesus. And everybody said amen. God bless every one of you. Thank you for tuning in. I pray that this message is something that can help you reflect and see if you have pride to overcome today. And if you do, be encouraged. All of us have to humble ourselves. In Jesus' name, God bless you.